wasn't uh, lifting and turning over the same rocks I was, I guess. No, I was across the street. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. I'm going to turn the light off to see if that makes any difference. Sure. I was on a yeah. Zoom meeting. I was on a Zoom meeting the other evening, and it was it was at night. It it looked like everybody was on uh, everybody on stage with you know <laughs> spotlights. How are you doing, Eli? Hanging in there. Yeah, I'm just uh, getting us set up to. Uh, well, bring Stella in. She'll be able to handle it for you. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good. How are you doing? Thank you so much for, for joining us. Yes. Oh, well, you're very welcome. It, it, sounds, it looks like there's uh, quite a list of people who are planning to be on, uh, on the uh, program today. Yeah, we, have about, we had about 90 RSVPs. Great. Which is a good number. Mm -hmm. yeah, and of course, yeah. we'll have to compare our, our older brains on when we were sort of riding in the same crowd there, young man. Yeah, yeah it's, uh, it's interesting how all this Zoom technology works. I know we've had a few meetings the past week and and my wife has a group of women that get together every Tuesday and so for coffee, but they can't do that. So they still get their coffee, but they sit in front of their Zoom and there's about 12 or 15 of them every week. So it's amazing. It is. Exactly. Well, we're just a couple minutes away from the top. We can get a few minutes, of course. Yeah, it looks like we have about 40 people right now. Oh my goodness. Good, good. Um, good number of folks. We have our trusty PowerPoint just to have us a holder. And, and uh, so David and I will do a kickoff and uh, just have a good conversation and engage Ted and Joe here. Good. And you're going to go back and forth between this and the cameras, Eli? Well, the cameras are up. Uh, it's kind of, I think there's a way for you to see cameras as well on your end, if you want to put the cameras back. Oh, I guess I can see them over here on the side. Yeah, they're on the side over there. Right yep. sidebar, yeah. Yeah, there's some sidebar okay. things going on. Okay. And you can, yeah, different ways of doing it. But I think, yeah, David will do our kickoff in a minute or two. You give me the thumbs up, Eli, and I'm ready to go. Excellent. Yeah, I started the record on it, so. Um, but yeah, I think we're probably good. Yeah, whenever you're ready, David, kick it off. Well, thank you, Eli. Uh, good morning. Everyone, this is uh, this is exciting. This is a fascinating way to bring us all together uh, at a time when all of us are, I don't want to say, stuck in our homes. We're safe in our homes, um, but this is a great opportunity uh, to connect, to converse, to to think about, you know, how the Paralympic system is the way it is today, and to to do somewhat of a revisionist history on another one of the aspects as to, to how we've gotten to this place. So this is our, uh, is our second official Stedward talk. For those of you that I have not met, my name is David Legg. I'm a professor in the Department of Health and Physical Education in Mount Royal, at Mount Royal University in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. And I was joking earlier with my American colleagues that I just finished watching uh, Tiger King last night with my wife and three sons, so I'm, I'm fully apprised of, of Americana, and I feel a little bit like Joe Exotic here on his, uh, his TV show, and of course my American colleagues were telling me that they've been watching Schitt's Creek, and I apologize for my language there, but that's actually the name of the, 
of the show. And it's a Canadian television show, so they're getting their full of Canadiana while I'm trying to learn all about the, the lifestyles of the rich and famous down in Oklahoma and Florida. Anyways, that's not why we're here. Um, we're here today uh, to talk about the Paralympic factor system and why it matters and how uh, it connects with the current um, challenges and opportunities that we find ourselves in the Paralympic movement. Um, my job today and task is to introduce our speakers and um, the, the co-moderator, but I also want to uh, uh, give recognition to those who kind of started this idea of a, of a Stedward Talks. And so uh, first and foremost, of course, is Dr. Robert Stedward, who was my teacher and advisor um, at the University of Alberta during my PhD and was the founding president of the International Paralympic Committee and certainly has a long and storied history within the Paralympic movement. So Dr. Sedward, thank you for allowing us to use your name uh, for these talks and thank you for being our first speaker in the fall and looking at the history of the Paralympic movement and its relationship with the International Olympic Committee. We were very, we're very glad and we're honored that you're able to join us today. Well, thank, thank you very much, uh, David, for giving me an opportunity to uh, participate. Uh, uh, I think this is uh, just a great way of uh, communicating with with other uh, sports scientists around the world with other coaches administrators that are all involved in the uh, Paralympic movement and and sometimes uh, we certainly wait to, to catch our communication newsletters and magazines and that but I think this is a very effective way to to share with each other what we're doing and what we've accomplished and I certainly am looking forward with great anticipation with uh, to hear what uh, Ted Fay and Joe Walsh have to say this morning. So uh, thank you for including me and I look forward to sitting back and listening to all the uh, wise words of wisdom. <laughs> well, I'm glad you're optimistic. Uh, so this whole concept of a Stedward Talks came about uh, between a conversation with myself and Eli and also Ted Fay, who's one of our speakers today, and Mary Humes, who's a professor at the University of Louisville, and then, of course, Dr. Stedward. Um, and really what we were trying to look at were ways and mechanisms by which um, we could consider the history of the Paralympic movement and, again, how it has an impact today, all of with, though, a lens towards the idea of inclusion. Um, and so I am now the president of the International Federation of Adapted Physical Activity and Eli and myself and the other colleagues are all related to disability and sport group. And so we thought between our organizations, we would co-host this concept of a Stedward Talk. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our two speakers, Ted Fay and Joe Walsh, and then I'll introduce Eli Wolf, who's the, the co-founder and the co-moderator today, and he'll kick us off. Um, with the presentation. So without further ado, if you'll allow me, I'm going to read the, the two bios of our of our speakers. I will not read the entire bio. That Ted um, no, please that would not. Take us, that would, take, like, us, that would take up the whole talk. All right. Yeah, so yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give a condensed version of Ted. Right, thank Fitt's you, bio. and then send it to me. <laughs> highlights, highlights. Yeah. But let me begin, let me begin with Joe Walsh. Joe Walsh is a two-time Paralympian and Paralympic bronze medalist in cross-country skiing, having represented the United States at Innsbruck in 1988 and in France in 1992. Joe is a graduate of Dartmouth College, where he did his undergraduate degree, and the University of Mass Massachusetts Amherst, where he did his master's degree. Joe served as an athlete representative on the U.S. Ski Association and the U.S. Olympic Committee Boards of Directors, and was the first Paralympian elected to the USOC Athletes Advisory Council. He was among the first employees of the USOC's US Paralympics Division, and Joe went on to serve as Managing Director and Deputy Secretary General from 2005 until 2012. Since 2012, Joe has served as a Strategic Planning Consultant for the International Paralympic Committee and is Vice President of the International Blind Sports Federation. He's now Director of the Adaptive Sports USA and is the Founder and President of Adaptive Sports New England, based in his hometown of Boston. Ladies and gentlemen, Joe Walsh. Our second speaker is Dr. Ted Fay, who's Professor Emeritus, and I once referred to him as Professor Emeritus, and is the <laughs> former chair of the Sport Management Department at the State University of New York, SUNY at Cortland. He holds a PhD from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, 
a master's degree from the University of Oregon and a bachelor's degree from St. Lawrence University in New York. Dr. Fay has served as a special advisor to the National Collegiate Athletic Association, the NCAA, on inclusive sport and is co-founder of Disability and Sport International, a founding member of the Board of Directors of Adaptive Sports New England, a former Paralympic cross-country ski race guide, national team head coach, International Paralympic Committee cross-country ski chairperson and technical delegate and technical classifier. Dr. Fay has an extensive background in international sport, including being active in the Olympic and Paralympic movements. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Dr. Ted Fay. My final introductory comments will be <laughs> for Eli Wolf. Oh no, I'm definitely <laughs> Eli is also based in Boston uh, and directs the Power of Sport Lab, a platform to fuel and magnify creativity, diversity, connection, and leadership through sport. Eli is also an instructor with the Sport Manager Program at the University of Connecticut and is co-founder and advisor to the Sport and Society Initiatives at Brown University in Rhode Island. Eli's work has been at the intersection of research, education, and advocacy in and through sport with a focus on sport and social justice, diversity, disability, and inclusion. <laughs> Eli has co-founded Disability and Sport International, Athletes for Human Rights, and Olympism Project, and Mentoring for Change. Eli has become one of my very close and dear friends over the last 15 years. It's a pleasure for me to be working with him, and I uh, am thrilled to pass it over to Eli now. As Excellent. father of two young kids, are we going to see those two children come through the door any moment now? Is that? It's very possible. You never know what's going to happen. They may just <laughs> stroll in like all those famous viral videos. You know? That's right. I have three teenage sons, so the odds of them even being awake by the time this ends is slim to none. Exactly. So without further ado, Eli. Perfect. Well, thank you all, and um, yeah, thank you for being a part of this, and thank you all for, for joining us. Um, now we're going to kick off the conversation. Uh, really excited about... Um, the second Stedward talk focusing on the history of the Paralympic factor system and why it matters. And we're really going to focus on uh, several areas. We're going to look first um, with Joe looking at the um, description and kind of understanding of the factor system. Um, then we're going to go into some of the history a little bit in terms of some of the key moments, really some of the highlights. Um, third part, we're going to really talk about inclusion and kind of how that developed through this and how it kind of disrupted um, some of the different notions of inclusion. Um, then we're going to look, take a bit of time at the Stedward time and, and, and having that conversation uh, with Dr. Stedward and, and looking at that time period of when um, Sted, uh, Dr. Stedward really engaged in the process. And then we're going to spend the time looking at the current challenges and the issues and then being able to open it up uh, to the Q&A. Um, throughout the time, uh, feel free to engage in the chat box um, with questions and comments. Um, and then we have the hashtag Stedward Talks. Um, this is being recorded and so forth. Um, so we'll keep this on track on time. Uh, so the first part, we'll, we'll hear a bit. We'll engage um, with, with Joe and Ted, and then we'll open it up so we'll have enough time for the Q&A and so forth. Um, so we're first going to um, invite and talk to, to Joe, have for Joe to, to share some remarks, some comments um, to help describe, um, give us a better understanding of the factor system. So I'll turn it over to Joe now. Thanks, Eli. Um, and thanks, David, uh, for inviting us to be part of this. Um, most of all, thanks, Dr. Stedward, for um, being the leader that you have been and that you continue to be. Uh, for the Paralympic movement um, and uh, moving forward this kind of uh, perspective and historical uh, uh, opportunity. So um, for those of you who, well, David gave you a little bit of a brief bio of me. For those of you who don't know me, um, I am legally blind. So if my eyes start to wander, I've got two screens up here uh, in front of me and I can't really see either one of them. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> so if, uh, if I start, uh, my head starts moving around or all of a sudden you're looking at the top of at my hair, um, <laughs> then uh, please forgive me for that. And I'll, I'll try and uh, get my, my, uh, my mug put back into the frame. Um, <laughs> before too long. Um, my role here at the start is uh, to maybe uh, be a bit of the glossary of terms, um, define, define uh, what the factor system is and uh, talk about how it intersects with classification. Um, so 
it, I will I will use the terminology the factor system, and you'll also hear the the term uh, percentage system, um, and we'll talk about factors and percentages. Those are the same thing. Um, the language used in the Nordic skiing world is percentages, and the language used in the Alpine skiing world is factors, but they really get used interchangeably. Um, and then truly they are. Um, the, the, the factor or the percentage as, as uh, we, we call it, um, is a, is a, a number is a number. Um, it's a, it's a, 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 a number that's a percentage of 100 um, or a percentage of one uh, that is then multiplied by race time in order to get a adjusted race time uh, that is then put into a put into the results. Um, I'll talk I'll back up a little bit on that. Um, but the 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 factor is you're taking a, a race time of if a alpine if a giant slalom race takes one minute and the factor is um is uh eighty percent then you'd take eighty percent of one minute and that would be the end result race time so that is as just a, a back uh, a, a definition um the other definition that we'll need uh is regarding the classifications that get used. Um, we're going to talk about alpine and Nordic skiing. Um, they use a very similar classification system, what, what derived out of the same historical classification system. With the visually impaired, you're all familiar with B1, B2, B3. Um, the physically uh, impaired group um, in, in uh, alpine and Nordic skiing is referred to as LW class. The LW standing for locomotor winter. So that's the historic language that is used. So LW two through nine, um, LW 10, 11, 12. LW two through nine are the standing classes and LW 10, 11, 12 are the sitting classes. Um, so classification as we're all aware, or I, I'm gonna presume that most of you are aware is the grouping of athletes participating in Paralympic sport um, such that uh, there can be a, a level playing field, a fair competition amongst those athletes. It's the grouping, grouping of them based on how their disability uh, affects their performance, how their disability affects performance in their sport. Um, and the notion is that we can take uh, these classifications and then apply them um, apply them so that we can have competition that's that's fair amongst groups of athletes who have similar impairments. The factor system is a competition format that then takes classification and is allows for athletes from different classifications to compete in the same race um, it being a Alpine and Nordic skiing the races are the form of competition. Um, so it you use that multiplication factor to build a competition format so that we can consolidate the uh, results into a single set of results rather than a set of results for each classification. So it really is it's it interacts with the classification system, but it isn't classification itself. Classification lives beside it. Um, and then the competition um, format is to use the factor system. We're going to talk a lot about uh, the history and how that evolved, um, but I'll stop there and um, turn it back over to our moderator and see if, if I need to fill in or, or hand it over to Ted to start the history. Excellent. Well, well, thank you for sharing that kind of initial understanding and kind of a description. Um, and kind of the understanding of it as a competition system, um, if it really is helpful. Um, maybe, David, I, do you have any follow-up questions at this point, or should we then turn it over to Ted to, to dig in a little bit? I'll turn no, it but I, I, yeah, I think, I think what Joe did is provide a very good uh, differentiation between the factor system and the classification system. And initially, when we started talking about this presentation, I think we were focusing more on the current challenges with the classification system, whether it was the Sports Illustrated article that we were looking at um, with swimming um, and or with wheelchair basketball with the, the Tokyo Paralympic Games. Um, 
however, I think, I think what we're doing is we're recognizing that both of these things address the issue of fairness. Um, and as with our Stedward Talks, one of our goals is to talk about looking at the past to help us understand the future or the present and the future. And so again, I think this idea of fairness, um, multiple people competing against one another, I think will lead to some really interesting thoughts and conversations towards the end of this presentation as to what the future may hold by taking what we learn from the factor system and embedding it within the classification system and some of the challenges that we're facing right now. But no, I think, uh, I think it's an opportunity now to turn it over to Ted and uh, get some, you know, get some ideas on kind of how this came about and, and, you know, perhaps, and, and, and part of, again, the reason why we're doing this is a lot of this isn't written down. Um, and so this is an opportunity to kind of hear from the source get a little bit of an understanding of to the history and the, the why things happened. And again, just to give an opportunity for people to interact and to engage and to ask questions. So I encourage uh, the, those that are intending to, to use that chat function and let's, let's get it going. Let's learn about this history of the factor system. Excellent. So yeah, we'll turn it over to Ted and to focus on those highlights, key moments, and also their origins. Um, so yeah, so please, Ted, uh, we'll turn it over to you for, for your comments. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Eli, David, Bob, Joe, for joining me. Um, yeah, this is a, a, a very special moment for me because even though there's a lot of side or you know one-on-one -on -one or you know small group conversations about, as David would put, the revisionist history of the factor system, um, perhaps this gives me a chance anyway to share a bit um, about sort of the genesis or impetus of how the system came to be. Um, I will try to be brief as I can, um, but uh, that's why we have two moderators and two, two friends to keep me on track. So I'm going to talk mostly about the, the genesis of the Nordic system, but it will be in parallel with the Alpine system as well. So dating back when I began my entree into the Paralympic movement as a race guide for a blind athlete was 1990 in Yalo, Norway. I think it's important to know that that was the second Winter Paralympic Games. And at that point, predominantly the Winter Games were being governed by um, the International Sport Organization for Disabled ISOD. They created the initial medical model as far as classification system, the LW classes that Joe referred to. Um, in 19, I'm just going to try to tell you a brief story. 1980, the U.S. sent two teams to YILO. We, we were uniformed differently. We were overseen differently. Uh, it was like we were from two different nations. One was the cross-country team, which I was a part of, and that was made up of blind, visually impaired athletes, men and women. And then the Alpine team was made up of standing um, LW2 to LW9 um, male and female athletes. There was no sit skiing at the time, but we sent two different teams. And I think this is kind of central to how what happened in a few years later. So we sent two different teams. It was very weird. Um, and at that point, and Bob, you can certainly relate to this, you were trying to manage the alphabet soup of different disabled organizations, all with a different agenda, all with a different interest. And so it was very interesting to be sort of in, in interjected into that environment. It didn't make sense to me. And, sure. at the time, and at the time, I was also involved with a very, I guess, progressive integration project in California, dealing with some of the most prominent disability rights leaders in the United States. So I was very tuned into fairness, tuned into this sort of balkanization of the games amongst parties based on disability. It didn't make sense to me because it so was- can I, can, I, can I interrupt just really quick? Was that, is that the Crip Camp bio that I just watched recently? Is that what you're talking about with your uh, reference to California? It could be, yeah. I didn't see that. Yeah, so the Judy Human history, yeah. Judy Human, you know, Ed Roberts, Bill Bronston, yeah. Oh, okay, okay. I was part of that gang, so uh, I was learning. But I think it's important to plant the seed that that we're very, in my mind anyway, I was very uh, sensitive and tuned to in integration, uh, both in terms of mainstream sport, mainstream society, culturally, but also this this was wacky to me. 
1992, we repeated the same mistake. We sent two different teams. Again, an Alpine team uh, made up of physically disabled athletes and a, a cross country team made up of, of blind athletes. I looked around and I was like, all these countries are one team except us. And we don't have any athletes with a physical disability uh, on our team. So when I came back, um, I had retired from ski racing by that time. And in 1983, at um, the US Nationals, in terms of alpine skiing, there was also a cross country opportunity for me to uh, engage with some athletes who had physical disabilities. And that's when basically um, there suddenly became another stakeholder group in cross country ski racing in US. But these athletes were, you know, below the amputees, single arm amputees, so forth. Uh, there weren't very many of them. And so by the time 1984 came around, I was co head coach with Gordon Opal, who was dealing with the blind team, but we, we decided we we're going to be one team. Uh, and that was very controversial. Uh, but we were going to be one team in the U.S. made up of all of these different athletes who were eligible to compete in 84. Um, that was really kind of the impetus of saying, okay, what's next? We need to have a viable championship, which we don't nationally. We need a way to invite more skiers and find more skiers. And at that point in time, serendipity occurred where I was involved with the U.S. ski team as well and in the uh, world championship in 1985. And at that point, discussions became very active about having the U.S. Um, Paralympic team, not that it was named that at the time, cross country and alpine, particularly cross country is the voice I gave it, but also Jack Benedict, uh, who is an icon in Paralympic sport and alpine skiing. He and I sort of conspired to look at trying to influence the U.S. Ski Association to invite or engage or welcome in, integrate, if you will, um, the U.S. Alpine, the U.S. cross-country disabled teams. And that, that occurred with a motion from the board in 85 that spring. And by, you can throw the first slide up there, Eli. Uh, and by the spring of 86, we were in the cross-country side already made inroads into competing as members of the U.S. Uh, Ski Association's National Championship in Royal Gorge, California. That would happen at this site, 86, 87, which is this photo in 88. So Ted, can I just interrupt for one quick second? I'm just seeing some of the questions that we're getting on the chat. Yeah. So just, just to provide a bit of context. So 1976 were the first winter Correct. Paralympic Games. Yeah. Um, can we talk just, a, so you've, you've jumped already to the 80s and the 90s, but can we just give a, just a quick overview of the disability groups that participated in the Winter Paralympic side from starting in 76, just to kind of give us a bit of a baseline? Yeah, good question. Uh, so in 1976, it was primarily an uh, al alpine group of European nations, and I don't have the history on Canadian involvement, but the U.S. sent one skier. Bill Havanek. And it wasn't until 1980 that the U.S., for example, and I believe Canada as well, uh, joined the fray in 1980. But again, the focus was primarily on standing uh, physically disabled athletes. 1980 was the first time that IPSA, the International Blind Ski Association, became involved. And also there were uh, both blind visually impaired athletes, both in cross country, but not in alpine in 1980. So you're seeing a progression of different groups joining in progressive years. Sit skiing would not, uh, Alpine and Nordic wouldn't become Paralympic medal events until 1988 in Innsbruck. Okay. So you're seeing, but also I'd like to emphasize at that point, it was a very sort of crude, in my view, very uh, with little connection to the sport or functional ability of athletes. So there was no functional classification that would come in in 89. Um, so it was a medical model in terms of how athletes were classified, a strict medical model. Um, and that created wide disparities, both in terms of that person's disability as it relate, may have related to someone else in their broad category. But the other thing at that time I think needs to be mentioned is that you had wide disparity in talent and training 
and skill. And so someone who would finish first might be, you would say, pretty well trained, pretty well skilled. Someone who finished third for a bronze medal might have picked up the sport a year before. So right. there was a real credibility issue. There was always a quantity quality issue uh, at that time, I would say well into the 2000s of the disparity between the, the, the overall talent or average talent of a field. And the other problem that was occurring is that you might have start fields in one race category. So uh, this is another thing that I missed, but I should emphasize, and I'm glad you asked the question. So the way it was organized is you skied in your disability classification category, period. So you could have three skiers, you could have 10 skiers, you could have 20 skiers, depending on the particular classification. And that was true both on both sides of the equation, Alpine and Nordic. Um, so that was, again, something that just left my head scratching. How could you have a valid race? I mean, I'll tell you a, a quick aside. Todd DeFries was a, a blind skier from, from uh, Wisconsin, showed up in 1982 as part of our team, won a uh, bronze medal in the 20, 30 kilometer event. Uh, but there were only four skiers in that event. He wasn't, he, he, he basically claimed saying, is this all there is? Is this all I have to do to win a medal? He, he never showed up again mm -hmm. after that competition in the 82 World Championships. So you get a flavor of the, this sort of swirl or fluidity of what was going on. Uh, and all that time, there was a push among a number of, of nations uh, but also a number of um, leaders, if you will, within certain nations, Jack Benedict being one of them, uh, Jerry Johnston from ca uh, Canada being another, um, and on the cross-country side, you know, the typical nations, particularly the Norwegians and Germans, were, and Finns and Swedes were kind of leading the, the effort. Um, and there was a real frustration of not being taken seriously as credible athletes and credible okay. team. Okay. So, so Ted, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step in here and provide the perspective of an athlete. Um, yep. at, that, at that point, I was competing as a cross-country athlete. Um, and the issue of the credibility was a real, a, a real you know, very real one uh, with small fields and, and a broad range of, of skill level. Um, so we were looking for how do we actually put together, you know, if we look at the, the field, we see we, we come to a, a national championships, there may only be 12 skiers there. Right. But let's at least put all 12 of those skiers together and have one race rather than having four races or six races or eight races, um, depending on their discipline, having everybody go home with a gold medal. Yeah. So we, we sat down with Ted's leadership um, and my brother Rob um, and I, uh, our math skills, uh, <laughs> and we came up with um, a system of creating, of, of using international um, data from previous competitions and looking at how the class, how each um, race class, each sport class um, performed, how multiple race, racers in each sport class performed um, and comparing that against each other. So um, that we could take that um, international data and apply the the fractions that we were developing the percentages um, that compared those those the performance of that those uh, sport classes at the international level and apply it to our domestic national championships so we could end up with that race um, we just saw the podium or maybe it's still up the um, with two B3s and one B1 on the podium and the B1 having bit, beat several other athletes, um, several other B2s and B3s um, in, in that race because of the adjustment system. So um, we, we worked hard to, to cultivate that and eventually moved to a model, not eventually, I think right away, moved to a model where we were applying not just within each of the disability groupings, not just within visually impaired standing and sitting, but putting everybody together. Um, yeah. And everybody had a comparable sport class, so a comparable fraction so that all the sport classes could race against each other. Um, 
that began um, really taking off at the international level in alpine skiing in the late 80s and early 90s um, and was a little bit behind the curve. Um, the Nordic, Nordic was a little bit behind Alpine in terms of the applicability of it because their race organizers uh, organization wasn't as strong. The Alpine had already established a World Cup in, during that period or was building a World Cup in conjunction with the FIS um, at, at, at that point, whereas uh, Nordic was still working just on World Championships and Paralympic Games. Right. So accelerate that through and we get it, um, get it up to the point of being in the uh, early to mid 90s. And I think Ted can talk about um, how we, how that system was used in the 90s. Yeah, I'm just gonna back up for a second saying that, so, when I arrived after 84, I'm going back a little bit, but when we integrated with the U.S. ski team, uh, U.S. Ski Association, we, we had to look, as Joe said, create it in a sense of credibility. The only chance we had, because we had so few numbers to begin with uh, across classes, is to create a system, as Joe well described it. Uh, and so this was actually our idea of integration among the groups, as well as looking to integration into mainstream sport, cross country ski racing, alpine ski racing. Um, 1988 was kind of a, a key moment in, in many ways because at the Innsbruck Games in January, we were also qualifying athletes in the B1 category and the LW2 men and women's uh, alpine category for a demonstration event at the Calgary Olympic Games. And it was also at that time, there was a real push both on the Alpine side and cross country side to actually have a, a greater, uh, a, a stronger relationship with the International Ski Federation. And at this time, you know, Dr. Stedward was embroiled into trying to bring uh, with his influence and others, uh, a new organization, the International Paralympic Com Committee to birth it and bring it to fruition. So 88, 70, 87, 88, 89, there was a lot of effort in terms of integration, in terms of mainstream sport, in terms of cross country and alpine, but also looking at how we organized our own sport. Keep in mind, I, the IPC did not take the governance control of alpine and cross country skiing until the 94 Lillehammer Games. Hmm. You have so, a good question actually about the uh, so I suppose computers weren't that convenient to use. What was it like to create these calculations? It's a good question. So I wanted to throw that out there at this point. Yeah, we, we, did, we did have um, Excel spreadsheets and, and the uh, first versions of the Apple Macintosh. So that's, <laughs> that's where we were based. We're at, the, we're at Dartmouth at the center of computing. So that's yeah, right. we, had, we had all the tools that were available. Yeah, we had great resources available to us. I was living just across the river in Vermont. So yeah, we had great, great resources there in terms of human talent as well as the lead computer options. The, so Ted, we'll, um, keep, we'll keep pushing along here. We'll in keep terms pushing of along, yep. So 88 was, as I said, was a watershed because, uh, well, for Do you want me to show any of these slides or just not yet? Yeah, I want you to put this slide up. Okay, perfect. Because what was happening within the able-bodied ski world was Diana Golden Brosnan uh, was uh, shaking the bush, so to speak, along with her fellow competitors and saying, I want to race in open races. And so the, and I'm going to have Joe talk about the golden rule. Uh, Diana was a legend in um, alpine skiing in the 80s. Um, she won the gold medal in 1988 giant slalom in, in Calgary. And that was the only gold medal, let alone only medal, the US ski team won in Calgary, period. So with that, Joe, describe the golden rule. Yep. So because of that leverage in Diana's personality and her um, and her uh, and her performance or her, her credibility just straight up watching her ski, um, she was looking for how do we how, how can she compete in open competitions. So the U.S. Ski Association adopted what is known still is known as the Golden Rule, which says that um, an athlete with a disability can start in the start position behind the elite seed 
So if the elite seed is 15, um, then the 16th slot would be uh, open or the, the spots following that would be open for athletes who have disabilities, skiers who have disabilities. Um, or if the elite slot, if the elite seed was 30, then it would go in there depending on what type of race it was. But she was instrumental in creating uh, integration into the open competition, not just Paralympic competition. And also during that period, that 87 to, uh, to 90, 92 period, even though the IPC had not come in as a unified governing body yet, we were still dealing with the issues of having separate governing bodies govern and oversee different disability classes. Regardless of that, both skiing, as I said, and uh, alpine cross country were really trying to move forward in terms of creating a united effort in joining the International Ski Federation, because we were frankly frustrated with the disabled uh, sports organization's ability to understand our sport and how we were moving towards a more integrated model. We had uh, demonstration events in the World Championships in Nordic in 1987 in Oberstdorf, Germany, and 1989 in Lati, Finland. So there was a lot of movement going on, but that's relevant too in terms of asking how this became adopted or accepted, um, both uh, being speak on the Alpine side as well as across the countryside. There are a few of us who were, were driving this sort of train, uh, but we also knew we needed allies. Uh, we needed allies. So on the cross country side, there, Alpine side, there was a strong unified voice between US, Canada, and Austria. Uh, on the cross country side, we actually intentionally gave this uh, model to the Germans and the Norwegians, particularly the Norwegians, to test at home. They were the top nations. If they adopted it and their athletes liked it, then their voice was going to carry the day. And that's basically what happened in both 90 and 92. We had created the IPC Nordic section already. And we were already moving this system into competitions, particularly where athletes who were outliers, maybe there's only one or two athletes in a particular class, the choices were they don't get to race in a Paralympic Games or World Championships, or they combine with a class that's more difficult and therefore probably have slim to no chance of really competing for a medal. We didn't think that was very fair. We thought that was crazy. So uh, basically, we introduced the concept very early on, starting in 1990 at the first IPC Nordic Sports Section uh, meeting in Jackson, New Hampshire. Again, at uh, Teen Albertville 92, the idea of let's take those classes that are at risk and use the factor system, percent system. <laughs> and so we began to use that as early as 1994 in Lillehammer. So we essentially had a hybrid system where it's not like the three-class system, which we'll talk about a little later, that's our category system that's emerged today. Uh, but we were using it. And we were using it in select races where we created the fields, both on the men and women's side, but particularly the women's side. And that brings us into the 90s. Yeah, that'd be great to talk you know, in the 90s. And maybe is that the stead word? Um, well, at this point in time, so the IPC was created in 89, so, this, so Dr. Stedward was the president, but Ted, as you alluded to, yep. uh, the, the Nordic scheme didn't fall under the IPC auspices until 94. No, it, no. It, it, well, in terms of the games, yes, but we had our own sports section that was I, under the IPC. So we, we were govern, trying to govern the sports, so to speak, even though the governance of the games hadn't transitioned yet. Right. So there's just, it's just not only turmoil, but it's certainly a time of transition. It's a time of... Uh... Turmoil's a good word. <laughs> getting it together. Yeah, yeah there was a lot of strong-mindedness on, on a lot of different sides. And, and also, just a, a, a historical note, the Soviet Union uh, came to the Paralymp Winter Paralympics in 1988 as a cross-country team, mostly made up of blind, visually impaired skiers. Mm. Uh, and it was evident then that they were going to emerge as a house like their able-bodied counterparts by the 1990s, and they did. But they were also became an important voice in this. And actually, uh, ultimately, people ask, well, how did this happen? Some of this is serendipity. Some of this is just pure, you know, uh, timing. Uh, and 
And some of it was actually in very intentional strategy and politics. There was a lot of heavy politic going on, politicking going on. First, to be able to gain the athlete's trust, as Joe alluded to earlier, and particularly the um, team, team captains, team managers, coaches. And they actually ended up driving, driving this sort of wave or movement in terms of adopting the factor slash percent system on a more comprehensive basis. Um, and so for them to kind of get their head around this whole notion of inclusion, and it seemed when we talked before this conversation, we talked about sort of the, how it sort of disrupted kind yeah. of the whole idea of inclusion and gave a new framework. And I think that's really interesting and kind of how, maybe just to speak on that a little bit in terms of those reactions to this new way of thinking about an inclusive model. Well, I want Joe to... Uh, yeah, you either for both of you. Yep, Joe or Ted. But, but I, I remember I was, I was either someone's friend or I was, you know, Mr. Evil uh, since the, the middle of the 80s into probably well into, we'll talk about one games in Salt Lake, where the, the, I felt the target was on my chest and my back at the same time. And it was really a matter of trying to you know, just really be persistent and earning the trust of the teams and the athletes that, th mm -hmm. that this is fair. This is more fair than you can possibly imagine. But the biggest problem we encountered was basically self-interest. Why do I want to give up my medals? Mm -hmm. Why do I want to join, a, a, you know, maybe a more credible race, more, more elite level competition, but I'm going to have to give up my medals probably because I'm not that good. Um, and there was a lot of haranguing about that. And, <laughs> and particularly um, understand that in the 80s, 70s and 80s, we basically had to raise our own funds to go to these games, to be able to be involved. I mean, there was no, other than, you know, Diana Golden is on the screen, she had a sponsorship with Chapstick, which was groundbreaking. She had one of the largest uh, sponsorships in the US ski team, you know, able-bodied or disabled team in 1988 that she but she was very much an outlier in that respect uh in a good way but we were mostly you know um had to raise our own funds and so people were saying well i need that medal to go back to raise more money so i can go to the next competition so it was a different mindset and, the mindset. and it was it was not easy to break that down particularly uh among certain nations or among certain athlete groups they did not want to give up what they had uh, for what we perceived was the greater good. But ultimately, Joe but ultimately well. the athletes and the coaches were the ones who drove this. Um, mm -hmm. the, they got closest to the emerging percentage system and the use of it uh, on an ongoing basis. Um, and they accepted it and, and, and uh, admitted that it was the best way to do to move forward. Um, it got used in, in, in part um, in, as Ted indicated, first in Tina, um, Albertville in 92, and in Lillehammer in Norway, um, only in 94, only where the race classes were um, very, very small and needed to bring together. Mm -hmm. The important part of, of being, of having the, coming under the auspices of the IPC was the rigor that began to be uh, imposed on the races. So as we uh, got to Nagano in 98, um, the, if you look at the results um, there, the, you'll see that there's a lot of combining of classes, especially in the women's fields where the field sizes were, were small. And you can look and, and analyze it out and see that, that uh, it was established that if you didn't have six athletes on the start list, you couldn't have a race. Hmm. So any place where a class didn't have six athletes on a start list, there was some level of combination, and that was using the factor system. Um, the Nordic was a little bit more deliberate um, in that it, it used, uh, it did combine the long distance race using the factor system by design. Um, and it was into a three category system. Um, and the language began, began coming clear here uh, that classifications and sport class were the LW2, LW3, LW4, LW5, uh, those were each, each a sport class, um, and the category became standing, and that was the standing category, and we ended up with three categories, the visually impaired, 
category, the standing category, and the sitting category. Um, and so those those came together and and so in Nagano, um, the the three categories were used for the long distance race and cross country and using those category systems um, some of the women's races were combined in both Alpine and in Nordic um, in order to create viable fields. Um, that same model was in was intended and designed and, and used in Salt Lake uh, where one race in the in the Nordic um, and Next slide. Uh, multiple um, multiple yeah. categories where needed was used in in both Alpine and Nordic um, but at that point the athletes and the coaches were really pushing hard to develop the three category mm -hmm. system uh, and to use the three category system because they had been using it in the World Cup races for years now mm -hmm. um, and so it was actually quite a topic of contention with the athletes and the and the staff to um, implement the three category system using the percentage or factor system. Um, and the politicians, the NPCs, um, looking to keep it as a 12 class system or 12, 12 mm -hmm. races system um, so that they could go home to their home countries and, and uh, mm -hmm. tout medals. You know, the smaller countries that may have had one athlete um, who, could win a, who could win a medal in a 12, 12 race season but couldn't win a medal in a three race series. Um, oh, that's so interesting. They, they were really the driving force. So it was the, a lot of the smaller um, that really were the driving force to keeping it, um, keeping it a, a, a multi-class system through Salt Lake. So um, Eli, you asked about key moments. So I wanna focus on a key moment in, from, I think Joe and I- Yeah, I wanna keep up on key moments and then also get into the stead word. Because yeah. a few minutes, we want to start opening it up to the conversation. But yeah, but please be going. So this is this is, I think, uh, from my perspective anyway, historically, was a very key moment. Is is Joe set the table very well that the athletes and the coaches were really pushing for, you know, a combined system. Let's get on with it. Uh, three category system. We hadn't quite made that politically, and I I was tr transitioning from being the technical delegate for. Albertville, Lillehammer, and Nagano to becoming a technical classifier, which was a new role introduced in, nine, in 2002 in Alpine and cross country, uh, particularly related to how you marry or try to marry or bridge the classification, which was then uh, had evolved into the functional classification system from the medical model to a more sports uh, centered or sports centric. Uh, classification system, which included those of us who are of practice, you know, former uh, athletes and coaches. So this was the race. This is the first race uh, that would take place in the standing classes uh, at Salt Lake. It was a, a, a very dramatic event, and I'm going to introduce you to three athletes in a second. But this race was a combined factor race. It, it included LW2 to nine classifications of athletes, both men and women. I'll focus on the men's race. And also up to, and this is also the intersection with issues around classification. So up to this point, athletes were classified at the world championships, international, they got their international classification at world championships or at Paralympic games, which were occurring every two years. So the last games were in Crans, Montana, uh, in 2000, but one athlete in the group I'm going to introduce you to had not showed up yet because he just turned 18 when he came up and came to Salt Lake. We've never seen him before. He was classified for the first time. And uh, basically, it created a conundrum because we had evolved rules. We had known the athletes. We had made some adjustments all this time. But suddenly, out of the blue, shows up an outlier from Norway. Um, and what occurred was really kind of a threshold moment that I want to share with you that might distill the, both the value and the contra some controversies over the system. So next slide. This is ha Niels Eric Bullset, who competed also in 2018. He was 18 in tw 2002. He was in the LW classification, which means he got he would be 
he would be assigned an individual percentage and the percentages ranged from 80% to 96%. Um, but it didn't at that point, it only was limited at 84%. So we'll get into that conversation in just a little bit. But what I needed to do as a technical classifier because he needed an individual classification, I need to assess his skiing ability. He could not perform classic technique because at the time he hadn't trained being able to put, bring his legs parallel, but he could do free technique quite well. So he's presented, he's given a functional classification. Now I was assigned to giving him a technical classifying uh, value because my counterpart was from Norway. She couldn't evaluate him, I had to evaluate him. Next slide. Unfortunately, Steve Cook from the USA was the top ranked standing uh, male skier in the world at that time, and he was also from a, a nearby community in Utah. He was a homeboy, and the press was all over this because he was going to be, you know, full of gold medals and podium finishes. And the U.S. ski team, U.S. Olympic Committee, and Paralympic uh, NPC, everybody was all over this from a media standpoint. The problem was I was not able to give. Niels Eric the proper percentage based on the rule because I couldn't change the rules on the spot. And I was limited by the highest percentage I could give him. So it turned out to be 84%. Steve Cook had a 96% in the third skier. Next up is Joseph Giesen from Germany, who is in yet another classification, which also gets an individual classification, uh, its own uh, individual percentage. And so what's important about this, and I want to illustrate this, is you have three different athletes from three different classification groups um, that all melded in terms of being able to race effectively in this particular race in order to medal. So that was one of the big questions at the time was, well, isn't it always going to go to somebody in a particular racing group? Uh, the fastest skier, if you will? And the answer is no, and this was evidence of it. <laughs> but this actual, this actual race precipitated a lot of conversations at this particular games. Um, and Niels Eric would go on to win another gold medal in this games. And unfortunately, Steve Cook ended up with four, four silvers. And Joe, you had conversations with the US team in this group. What were some of the things that they were bringing up at this point in time? Well, I think, it, I think that it, it stemmed out of the fact that Steve in world championship competitions um, prior to this and World Cup competitions had, had been very dominant. Um, and then all of a sudden this new kid was there and um, he, he showed up and was then given a percentage. Um, and of course, everyone thought it was the, everyone on the U.S. side thought it was the wrong percentage, thought it was too favorable to him um, and needed you know, needed to vent on that because they felt that Steve should have been the gold medalist in all those races where he finished silver. So there's a question about were you using a mathematical model for setting percentages or was it simply best estimate? No, no, it was a mathematical model, but it was, but, ba the, but the model understand was based on the grouping, not the individual. Hmm. If it's, it, 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 I mean, I may not be clear here, but LW3 classification has athletes with multiple disabilities in it. There's not, it's not as simple as an LW4 who is below the knee amputee, or an LW2 who is above the knee amputee, or an LW68 who is someone who uses a single pole but has a disability of some nature, amputation or otherwise, in one arm. Th those are clear cut. But in the LW57, LW, LW57 is actually pretty clear cut too. Uh, in the sense that those athletes, as you see with jo Joseph, doesn't use any poles. But the LW3 category, the LW9 category, were ranges of different disabilities. And those had to be sorted out in terms of the functional ability of the athlete. Just a quick follow-up. Sorry, just a quick follow-up. Curious how often and on what schedule factoring percentages are reviewed and revised? We can address that Every later, year. too. They're revised annually and, and have been for quite some time now. Um, 
the system has become increasingly rigorous as more data became available and as the IPC um, instituted more statistic, you know, a more statistically sound um, mechanism for doing the calculations. So um, the, the calculations now are very robust. Um, and this notion of having an individual, assigning an individual percentage no longer exists. Um, it was sort of an experiment at the time as the system was evolving. Um, that has been eliminated from the system now. Um, so both Alpine and Nordic uh, have, you know, continued to increase the the the, um, the strength of the calculations, and now have systems in place where multiple years of data are used over multiple competitions um, to create um, a, a, a mathematical model. And there was another key result, a consequence of, of this particular games in this particular set of races, at least on the Nordic side, I can't speak for the Alpine side, is we then went to a pre-classification system prior to games. So we wouldn't end up with the same situation where someone would show up sight unseen and be an outlier. Uh, they, they would have a set of results that could then be more competently you know, integrated into the system um, with more assurance. We had no, we had no data, absolutely no data on the little set in, that, in 2002. And that changed radically after these games. So in Torino, for example, we had uh, not only world championship, but in the season building up, the same season building up to the games, we held three classification uh, opportunities at World Cups prior to Torino. So we didn't, put ourselves in the same situation. We also changed the rules. So if there was a, you know, just absolutely unanticipated uh, circumstance that we hadn't thought about in terms of, of rule application, that the race jury could actually take this into account during, during the competition and evaluate if in fact, like the question was asked, was in, in the U.S. team definitely felt, and I agreed with them actually, but I, could, I, I as a technical classifier had no option to make a different decision than what I did. I, I put him in the highest percentage that was provided. Uh, it wasn't high enough. He should have been at 87%. And which he, what is what these two guys raced, all three guys raced against each other again in Torino and Cookie beat all set. And, and, and Steve Cook beat uh, Niels Eric in 2006. So that's the story. So, so what's, David, what's like Go ahead. So, David? Uh, go ahead, David. I see, I see Mike Frogley's question, but what I want to do before we get to that, because I, I... We have a couple of questions we, that have come in as well, yeah. But we can hold on them, I think, and so, yeah, go ahead. I'd like, I'd like to connect kind of, you know, 2002 Salt Lake and, and Ted made reference to Torino in 2006 to today. So let's, let's get caught up to where we're at right now with this factor system and how it relates to the parallel movement. And then let's get to kind of philosophically how this relates now to some of the conundrums perhaps that we're seeing within the classification system. Okay, so that's pretty short, short um, music on, on the, the history from there. Um, at the sport forum, the Nordic skiing sport forum in 2002, right there at Salt Lake, um, and then at the Alpine Sport Skiing Sport Forum in 2004, which was held at Vilchenau at the World Championships. Um, the, the nations um, adopted the three category system to be implemented at Go to all slide future. Five. I'm going to share the slide. Okay. Yeah. Next slide. The Next last one. one. Okay, perfect. So, so the, 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 so starting in Torino, it has been a three category system in all IPC events, um, World Cups, uh, lower level competitions, World Championships and Paralympic Games. Um, the, you, I'm not sure what you're seeing here. Um, so what you're seeing is a comparison of the evolution of the, of the factors. Uh, this is for Nordic skiing. Um, across those time frames from 2010 to 2014 and 2018. Um, and so in 
one of the things that you can see tied to the question that you that was asked just a few minutes ago was you know how robust are these numbers or how how do how is how are they calculated um they're they're reviewed and calculated annually um but as you can see they they're pretty stable too um and that's part of the design using the statistics that are being used um a regression model for those of you at that level of understanding uh, to to ensure that um, if there is movement because of individual athletes who come on and perform differently than others, um, that that gets um, the the effect of that gets minimized. Um, so that you really what you're doing is looking at um, the group and any individual who shows up with that classification, which gets done separately. They show up with a classification. That classification gets assigned this percentage that you're looking at on the screen um, that's associated with that. Um, with that classification and that way it's all it's all about setting it for the for the group the, the classification class the sport class um not about the individual athletes which was part of the challenge that we ended up with in salt lake another thing that happened after salt lake is you'll notice the sitting category was broken into five groups not three um, so the progression historically went from two groups starting in Innsbruck and LW10, LW11, and that ended up morphing into three categories in the 90s. And then after uh, Salt Lake in 2002, it broke into now five different classes in the sitting classes. And that's the same. <laughs> yeah. So where yeah, are we at? Go ahead. Uh, David. Yeah, I was thinking we could start to address some of these questions that have come in. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Ted and Joe, where are we at today with this system? And then we'll get to some of these questions. Well, the, the system um, is, is well established and well accepted within the skiing communities, um, each, of, each of the Alpine and Nordic separately as, and together. Um, and really uh, totally believe, and I mean, one evidence of that is if you try and find the description of what the uh, what the uh systems are um in the uh, if you can find the individual years, like the numbers that are here on the screen those are easy enough to find but if you go into the rule books um of Al ipc or world para alpine and world para nordic skiing um they're the, the factor system isn't even referenced or it's very loosely referenced very uh, lightly referenced um, there's not really a big description. It's become a real c part of the culture that this is the way we do races. Um, it doesn't need explanation. It, it, it doesn't get argued over. Um, it's, it's just part of how we do business. It's, part, it's the same as you know, using a clock. Um, mm -hmm. it, you use this factor system. So within the skiing communities, there seems to, they're, they're, it's very highly accepted and, and without, without question. Um, not without question, but no questions, let's say. Um, but there, as it, uh, many of you may be aware that uh, a year ago, the IPC governing board issued a statement saying that over time they would eliminate percentage systems. Um, and that came as some surprise, I think, to the, to the skiing communities. Um, and uh, that, that, that statement has since been um, not retracted, but, but uh, added to to say, you know, that it'll be taken under consideration or it'll be reviewed. The use of percentage system will be viewed um, by the governing board and the IPC um, for for future applications, um, but sort of taking the the um, taking back the statement that they would be eliminated. Um, so there remains some question about uh, challenge the the use of the system um, outside of the um, athletes and coaches. So a point, a point of context. Well, let me just insert. Go, go ahead. Uh, for those folks who are uh, on on this um, with us today, you might not be aware, some of you may be aware, that historically and currently, um, Nordic and Alpine, and, or cross-country and, and biathlon and Nordic and Alpine, historically are time trial events. You know, it's individual starts primarily. Yes, they're mass starts. There's other formats now that have been inserted, but primarily these sports have been foundationally predicated on an individual start, which means the first person over the line is not the winner. 
Mm -hmm. And culturally, that's really important to keep in context here. It's sort of like cycling time trialing. It's the Our first goals. person out of the group, shoot is not, not necessarily the winner. Um, and so that context needs to be keep in, kept in mind about how this um, system evolved and why it is so widely supported, as Joe just said. Excellent. So if, if I may, so I just want to, because Ozzy's wiki has chimed in, Joe, I just want to read to you Ozzy's comment. He goes, interesting point from Joe is very true. Everyone in the community is you're a little bit no. breaking up there, yeah, we're up a little. The status of what is taking place and assessing is that. Eli, can you read Ozzy's yeah. comment? Because I, again, I might, might be my internet system here. That's okay. Yeah, I know Ozzy had just had a great comment about. Um, we have a factor working group in uh, WPIS that meets with athletes and coaches each season to update them the status of what is taking place on assessing any changes so that may be required for a refinement process. There's continual consideration of data available to us, working group to ensure that factors remain evidence-based. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So should we turn out, maybe we can start to address, um, like Mike, Mike Frogley has a great question. Um, yeah. We also have another I think, good ones. But yeah, go ahead. I think we addressed Phil's, I mean, I think we addressed Phil's question. Um, as related to the use and IPC classification, but I do let's let's get yeah, to uh, yeah, yeah, Phil's, yeah. let's 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 get to Mike Frogley's comment and question. Eli, do you want to read that just again? I think my internet's breaking up here. Yeah, yeah. No, uh, we had actually talked about this in our prep and kind of thinking about the different connections of the this factor system and classification to other sports. Um, and so Mike brings up a great question about the physical center that drove the factor system and athletes wanting to have a competition that was at the highest level. This appears to be out of alignment with the recent position of IPC on International Wheelchair Basketball Federation athletes, specifically athletes classified as having a minimum disability. Can you share your thoughts on the apparent dissonance? So again, kind of connect all this we've been talking about to some of the other sports and just again to kind of open the broader dialogue. So maybe Joe or Ted or um, just I missed where the dissonance is, Eli. The dis just kind of thinking about kind of how to create systems of inclusion and how the factor system is working and how that might be a framework of thinking for other sports and given the issues now within wheelchair basketball. Let me okay. weigh in on that because in the 93 uh, IPC sport um, council meeting we had a discussion of this of whether this system what is the system people are learning about it from other sports and i remember colin rain saying we have to protect the athletes who have perceived the maximum disability competing in a sport so if you look here it would be athletes in the five seven category uh the lw10 category uh, the B1 category. In other words, maintaining an opportunity and a fairness opportunity for athletes to, to sustain their competition with going to a start line knowing there's a fairness that, that accommodates their need in the sense that otherwise they would be eliminated from the sport entirely. So I think it gets to Mike's question about if you look at um, you know, what is the range of athlete eligibility in wheelchair basketball? You don't go to a model where it's only the most minimal athletes with minimal disability. This factor system, percent system, actually protects the interest of the, of the athlete who um, has, let's say, a more challenging or complicated impairment. Uh, it was intentional to do that. And I think that over the 35 years that this system has been employed in some way or another, it's done that. Excellent. Oh, great. Oh, thank you. So that's, we're going to take just the next, the next questions we have. Um, the Phil Allen question is, did the recent IPC classification review have a significant impact on factoring process calculations? And then we have a couple other questions to follow on that. Yeah, I, although I'm I'm not the authority on this, um, yep. I I think that the um, the classification system. I think as I've tried at the beginning, the classification system sits alongside the factor system. 
So if the classification system for Alpine or Nordic does get significantly disrupted by the IPC classification review process, um, if there are major changes that get to the classification system, then that definitely will um, lead to the need to reanalyze some of the data and come up with revised factors that are then fair using for the for the new classes, the new sport classes. Um, but in terms of the uh, IPC review of the classification system in each of Alpine and Nordic, and I'm not sure where either of those stands, um, but uh, it, it didn't engage the topic of the factors because the the factors are are again really their technical um sport format uh competition format issues not classification issues i can i can Excellent. answer that a little bit there was okay. definitely disruption after 2002 in salt lake on the nordic side because we and i can't speak for the alpine side i'm sure there was probably equal disruptions uh but from a classification standpoint because we went to a five category system in, in sitting classes, the sitting category, uh, there th that had to be remodeled in terms of looking and looking at the regressions, how an, a 10 point, uh, someone who is in the LW 10.5 or 11.5 uh, classification um, would fit in, into the percentages because up to that point it was a three uh, classification model of 10, 11, 12, but those are pretty wide bands. And so my sense is, is this is more, uh, there was, I, I was involved in 2006 and 2010 at uh, Torino and Vancouver, and I think it's a more, of, it's, it's settled itself out. In other words, you have enough data now that you have enough yeah, but the issue still, as Joe said, go, falls back on the classification side, is where does that athlete fit into? Do they fit into he or she, like an LW? Are they really a 10 or a 10.5? Mm -hmm. Great. Really a 10.5 or 11? And those are the questions that, that remain um, in, in, <clears throat> in the discourse between athletes and, and teams and everybody else. I think that, that brings us to present time Good. where – you you see that in the sitting categories particularly because of the nature of the classification process and i will say that in 2003 the group, the group of us who were involved in nordic classification we were very cognizant that we needed some more, you know you talk about evidence base we wanted to bring more science into this than was available to us at the time we presented a uh, grant uh, opportunity or a research plan to the IPC in 2003, and I have to say it was it was not accepted uh, because that was not the focus at the time. Or but I think that I think at this time um, it really is very very rigorously um, pursued. I think in part because of your efforts to make it that way. So I wanted to bring in. I guess David, I'll address one question, and then maybe you could address the next. The question that I wanted to bring in um, comes from Katrina. She's asking about the relevance of the factor system into the NGBs again, uh, and also into IFs, international you know, kind of using, will they start to combine the qualifier events as a result, particularly as there's more intersection of the Olympic and Paralympic committees and so forth. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, just a question. I mean, we're just going through some of these questions and I'll, I'll, David can take the next, you know, look at the next question, but. This question is about the NGBs and the IFs. Well, Joe and I will remember that when this started, and now we're going to loop all the way back to, to the history, is when we started this and, and implemented the factor system in 86, the intention was that we were already engaged in the NGBs and we were intending to engage in the IF in skiing uh, with the intention that a system like this could be utilized. Uh, where it even combined the inclusion of uh, athletes without a disability. In fact, the, the first script, if I'm not mistaken, Joe, my memory may be foggy, but uh, we actually normed this off able-bodied skiers at the time. Yeah, the system, the system set up to allow that. Um, it would require some level of data 
of um, Paralympic para sport skiers, para skiers um, competing at the same time on the same courses as the athletes in the open field in order to create the percentage between each of these uh, sport classes uh, and the open field to have the open field be there. Which um, we to, had to establish with, a percentage for the open field. Yeah, which, which um, we had with the national championships back in the 80s. Right, which we did in the 1980s, but that data is so old that it, it no, it's uh, not usable. Probably is not not useful. Right. Right. Um, but it, it would be ready to do that in terms of whether the IFs or the NGBs are interested in doing that. Um, I'd say at this point that isn't uh, that isn't an active conversation that I'm aware of. Although I'm not I'm not the most active in in that forum at this point. So. Yeah. So I, I want to, there were a couple of comments related to paratriathlon and how it's using a, a factor system and um, both Ozzy and another, oh, I can't remember who it was, I think it was Taylor, made the comment about the complications of outlier athletes and uh, exceptional athletes who come in and perhaps push the boundaries of the, of the assessment process. I, we're getting, we're getting close to the end of the time, and I certainly want to give Dr. Sedward an opportunity to kind of provide some summary thoughts and just some comments from his time with the International Paralympic Committee. I do want to point out that he was not the president after 2002, so we can't blame him for all this stuff. <laughs> all that city. Um, I want you to, to, if you were in charge, um, Ted and Joe, if you were responsible for the current state of affairs within the Paralympic movement and perhaps even beyond the Paralympic movement, just the, the sporting system per se. What's the ideal system in your opinions um, as it relates to the factor system and how it might relate to the classification system uh, for allowing athletes with a disability to compete fairly? Well, that's a big question, David. I think that there's always um, multiple solutions that are available, right? I mean, in, just in the Paralympic world, there's um, we use the, the factor system and system in, being in the two skiings. Um, the triathlon is, has done some, some work with a similar system. Swimming combines uh, athletes with different types of disabilities into um, the same sport class uh, for competition there. Um, so there are definitely some some models that work um and each of them has its their critics and each each has its uh supporters and each has its critics um i i think that this is a viable model and as the last as i said in the la answer to the last question i mean it's a viable model for in in integrate integration uh with the open field of competitors as well as uh integration <coughs> with uh, with the uh, among the Paralympic skiers, um, but uh, it's it's something that that could work, um, and I think could could come to be accepted uh, broadly with just uh, the modest amount of education. Yeah, I would I would agree. I think, it, but you have to focus on the sport and actually build it out from the sport itself, and so you're not trying to really. I hate to use the word corrupt the sport in terms of making so many alterations to the way the sport is normally practiced. And so it's multiple systems. It's not this system wouldn't work for every sport. Uh, it may work for others. But it, 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 so I think uh, one needs to be open minded about how different sports are not only conducted, not only retrospectively, historically, but going forward into the future. Uh, but I, so it's multiple systems, um, trying to figure out what, what's basically common sense and ultimately with a model of inclusion and fairness is, is holding court as far as the basic principles. Excellent. Do you see a future where this system allows competition between able-bodied athletes and athletes with a disability in a fair and equitable way? Absolutely. It certainly could. Dr. Sedward, I want to give you an opportunity now uh, to provide some comments, some feedback on your views as the past president of the Canadian or of the International Paralympic Committee and certainly your involvement with the Canadian Paralympic movement. And you were in Calgary in 88 when Ted made reference to the Olympic Games being held here in the demonstration event. And you've seen, an op you've seen this firsthand. Uh, 
can you provide some summary thoughts, your, your views on the conversation that we've had today? Uh, thank you, David. Uh, well, hopefully I can uh, provide a couple of thoughts anyway. Um, first of all, I think we have to realize that there was a significant difference uh, in the history of the uh, winter sports compared to the summer sports. Um, they, of course, the summer sports started a bit earlier in 1960 and, and uh, in Sweden in 76 for winter. Uh, and I always found more, say, from a Canadian point of view, going with the teams back in 76 to Sweden and Yilo and that, that uh, they always talked about sport. They didn't talk so much about disability. Uh, and mainly because uh, in Canada, the, the sport was the sport. It didn't matter whether you had a visual impairment or whether you had uh, an amputation or whether you're a spinal cord, you were in the sport of alpine and Nordic skiing. So it was a different mentality in, uh, throughout our history on the winter side compared to the summer side because the summer side was larger and more complex because you had team events like uh, wheelchair basketball and athletics and swimming and, uh, and the like. Um, but remember, we started off as a mere fledgling caught within the superstructure of sport and we've come a long, long way. I know we all, uh, because we've been in, involved for so long, we, we feel we need to um, continue to grow and expand and improve. Uh, and we have moved more from a recreational medical model to a high performance functional sport model. And I was involved with that medical model back in the uh, 60s with Goodman and I remember having major uh, fights with him because uh, of his medical approach and my sport approach. It was always uh, very, very difficult, but I certainly have my hat goes off uh, to both uh, Joe and Ted for the tremendous uh, um, leadership and inspiration they've provided, uh, not just to uh, Nordic sport, uh, but also to the international, to the Paralympic movement as a whole, because of the work that they're doing in the factor system. However, it does tell us that we need to look more carefully at the role uh, of the IPC and the role of sports. Uh, we tried to jam that very closely together back in 89 when IPC was first created. But remember, we had a lot of challenges there because uh, ICC, the old governing body, wanted to hang in and be a part of, of uh, the present and future development of sport. Uh, and they were very much built on a disability model and not on a sport model. So the transition, uh, for example, from uh, 80, 84, 88, 92, for both the summer and winter, uh, that transition was very, very difficult. Uh, when we talk about the inclusion aspect, remember, not only did we have Calgary uh, inclusion in the Olympics, but Sarajevo in 84 also had the inclusion of the Alpine event. So we had two events there plus the summer in Los Angeles in 84. So inclusion was going on, but we've talked forever for the last 40, 50 years about how athletes with a disability uh, can more integrate within the so-called able-bodied sports scene and can they compete against it and we can and we have had all sorts of uh examples there and uh, but again it comes down to classification so my challenge out there is to uh, look at organizations like ifapa looking at organizations like the ipc through vista to come closer together to look more carefully uh, at the tremendous achievements we've made, but also to look very, very seriously at the challenges that we have uh, for the future, because we do have a lot, and, and we've unraveled 
uh, a number of those challenges just in the past uh, hour, hour and a half with Joe and Ted and with the factor system and, and, the, um, and the Nordic side of things. And they did it uh, terrifically, uh, uh, just a, a, did a great job. I was found it interesting, I found it inspiring, but my mind just starts getting on a roller coaster on the downslope saying, <clears throat> Uh, if this is where it's come from, this is where we're at. Just think of where we could be in the next mm. 20 years, which I likely won't be around for anyway. <laughs> but uh, I hope so. there is a lot to, to do. Uh, and, I, and so my challenge is not only to bring those organizations together, but to challenge leadership to come and take a hold of all these, uh, all these opportunities and challenges to stir them up a bit and try to make uh, try to make a difference and leave a legacy, uh, because I, I know that uh, that that factor system came from somewhere and it came from that wonderful history that Ted and and Joe not only talked about but lived, and I just hope that that history is recorded somewhere in detail because we need to know the impact that that history had on the factor system, which has, a, has, a, has an, um, an impact on the, um, on the whole IPC classification system. And I remember I was involved in a similar factor system back in Montreal with Roger Mondor in 1975, 76, when he had the uh, games air, which was like a pentathlon of multiple disabilities, male and female, and you came out with came out with the top three people, and the top three people in the first year was a male quadriplegic, the second was a female paraplegic, and the third was a, a was an amputee. So there has been all sorts of great things come out, but uh, uh, I could go on forever, as you know, uh, David. You know, after you've spent you know, more than 50 years of your life in, a, in the Paralympic family, it, uh, you see a lot that's happened. But I do want to congratulate and thank uh, Joe and, and Ted for their great contribution to the sport, to the Paralympics, uh, and to the factor system. Well, thank you, Dr. Sedward, for your you. kind concluding comments. And thank you to Ted and Joe for being our second panelists on our inaugural year of hosting the Sedward Talks. Uh, Eli Admittedly, Eli and I haven't talked about the next word talk, so stay tuned to all of you who are uh, on this call right now. Again, this was our opportunity and attempt and effort to have a, a look back at the past so we can understand the present and the future, and specifically in this particular instance as it related to classification and the factor system and just the idea of fairness and inclusion um, with athletes with a disability. So on behalf of uh, all those who I mentioned at the start, so Mary, Ted, Eli, myself, Dr. Sedward, and now Joe, uh, thank you to everyone who attended. This ha was recorded, Dr. Sedward, to your point, so we certainly, um, Disability and Sport and IFAPA are happy to share these archives with people so that it's a long-lasting repository of the history of our movement and how it's going to impact the future. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for attending. We look forward to uh, chatting with you again in perhaps the, new, the near future. Uh, we'll see, and we hope you've enjoyed this presentation. Thank you, and have a great rest of your day. Thanks, David. Thank, Thank you, David. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. We'll be closing it out here shortly. Have a good day. It's over. <laughs> great. I'm going to close out on the Zoom. We'll... Okay. Thank you Goodbye. all. Thank you. Hey, I, I have a question. That was excellent. Um, Great job. We have a lot of, we, we, I'm sure you didn't get, weren't able to get through all the 49 questions. Um, do we want to set up a mechanism to be able to answer some of them if, if so or not? What do you think? Yeah, I can we, copy them and take them and circulate and then we can look at what we want to do for follow-up. We usually do some follow-up in terms of sharing out the recording, the material, the PowerPoint. So we can do something like that over the next few days. And Eli, we should get a copy of all those questions from the chat before we sign out because we'll probably lose it if we do. Um, I believe it will stay in there, but yeah, I'll, I'll make sure we, we grab them. So, so Eli and David, how did you feel about that? 
Excellent. You guys did a great job. Everybody, it was it was excellent. Yeah. By the way, we're still talking to everybody. Um, yeah, we're not yeah. recorded. And <laughs> yeah, we're no longer recorded, but we're uh, yeah, we're still we're still, still chatting live. away. We still have a few attendees, and okay. I think we're going to listen start, into the conversation. I guess that's what we're yeah. No worries. Yeah, I'm yeah. going to yeah. close it out here. Outtakes. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to close okay, it I'm out. Enough here. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. We'll talk soon. We'll debrief. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Nice Thank job. You.